Good morning, everyone. My name is Raquel, if you don't know my name already. Um, we're still waiting on a few more people to show up and to join us. <clears throat> so we'll give them one more minute and then I'll begin with my presentation. Is everyone enjoying all the snow in your area? If you have snow? Yes. Tim, how much? How many inches of snow do you have? Uh, not, not like you and Pinyon. You got a lot of <laughs> and I saw your I saw your Facebook post and you guys got hammered, but we didn't <laughs> maybe about eighth of an inch. But you know, your new building's coming up, looking nice. I drive by it every day, it's getting better and better. I'm really excited. It looks so good with the doors and the windows on there now. Yeah, they got it taped up right now. They're doing the inside the interior work right now. So we'll go ahead and start with my presentation. I'm gonna turn off the music now. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. There's still more people joining us. And here we have the man of the hour, Mr. Isaac. I'm going to go ahead and give a brief overview of Chains Labs and who we are and what we do. And then I'll go ahead and turn over the time to our speaker for today, Mr. Isaac, Mr. Brett Isaac. So yeah, there everyone, Shay Raquel Black Yunishia. I am Kia Ani, born for Sanja Kinneth. Ashinha are my Chays and Totochinis are my Nullis. <clears throat> I am a member of the Navajo Nation and I am from Shanto, Arizona. I'm also the co-working manager here at Chains Labs. And thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to be with us here. First off, I'd like to give a brief um, introduction to Chains Labs for those who aren't already familiar with our organization, Chains Labs. Our goal and mission is to provide creative workspace tools, resource, knowledge, and uh, information <laughs> for native entrepreneurs. We, how we accomplish our goals and our mission is through our different programs. We have the co-working program, the business incubator, Kinship Lending and our business, our Doing Business, which is an up and coming program. Here's this, this is our team that we have here. We have Jessica, Cecilia, Joe. There's a lot of them on our call here today. So if you want to send them a message and say hello, they're here. Uh, we have Christine Laughter, our Kinship Lending Director, Tim Deal, our Incubator and our Kinship Coach, and then myself, and I'm the Coworking Manager. <clears throat> To talk about the co-working program, which is the program I oversee, I'd like to share a little bit of information here. Um, for those of you who are near Tuba City, uh, you may have been avail sorry, aware of our co-working studio over at the Mo Kobe Legacy Inn campus for the past few years. That space is no longer open, but the construction is currently underway for our new headquarters, which will be located right next to the Tuba City Chapter House on Main Street. For those of you who may not be familiar with what a co-working space is, it's a community space for business owners and entrepreneurs to use to help, and to help operate and manage your business. <clears throat> this space in particular we're still, will be used to help um, business owners operate and manage your business. Uh, I read, you read it. We'll serve our native entrepreneurs and small business owners, especially those based on the Navajo and Hopi nations in the Four Corners area. So later this spring, we will have a brand new co-working space available for you to use and some of the services that we will have to offer are some tools that could be useful to your business. Uh, tools such as desk space, Wi-Fi access, color printing, in-person coaching sessions, and a lot more. We also plan to bring back monthly in-person trainings for those who are interested. And our list of co-working services is constantly being updated as far as how we support and learn support our local entrepreneurs and business owners there at the new headquarters space. <clears throat> We're always open to new ideas and how, on how we can better uh, service our local entrepreneurs and in our, in our communities. So if you have an idea on how this co-working space can benefit your business, please let us know. We're really excited to bring this community space for everyone to help with building and growing your business. So please stay tuned for more information to come as our construction gets closer and closer to completion, which should be very, very soon. The latest update was within the next month. <clears throat> uh, moving along, one of the most popular questions that we get here at Chains Labs is how do I start a business? All of our programs and services here are designed to help um, our native entrepreneurs, our artisans, our local vendors, and those we like to call change makers because that's what our local business owners and entrepreneurs are, they're change makers. If you're a native entrepreneur or small business owner yourself, know that you're absolutely crucial to our local economies and Chains Labs is here to help you both start up and strengthen your businesses. 
Now for a brief overview of our business incubator program, it's one of the only native led business incubators for, the na for native entrepreneurs in this country. And we're right here in, on the Navajo Nation and the border of the Hopi Nation. This program is led by our director of business incubation, Cecilia So, who is here today. And starting this year, it's a six month program for native entrepreneurs who want support and training on how to start and operate your business. If you're interested and would like assistance with things like your logo, uh, your website design, or how to set up and maintain your bookkeeping finances, please visit our website here for more information at nativestartup.org slash incubator. Next is another question we get often, how do I get help running my business? <clears throat> There's so many aspects to being an entrepreneur and the answer or solution that you may be searching for may not always be obvious. Uh, here at Chains Labs, one of our driving factors is kinship, building relationships among communities and nations. And how Chains Lab can help there is through our business coaching appointments. We offer free virtual 90 minute appointments with any of our business coaches. Our coaches are available on Mondays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And they each, each of our coaches have their own area of, our, of expertise, depending on the kind of support that you're looking for. <clears throat> We have a team of very bright and very eager coaches, and they're each incredibly knowledgeable in their specialties and will be able to assist you where you're needing help with your business. The coaches are able to help with uh, marketing to accounting and bookkeeping systems, or if you're just starting out, they can uh, help you with um, creating a business model or navigating the Navajo Nation systems for things such as your business site lease or registering with the Navajo Nation business regulatory. This coming Monday, we have Coach Holly, who's also here today. She can assist you with things like brand development, market analysis, social media marketing, uh, business registration in New Mexico, and a lot more. She's very, very, very bright. <clears throat> and you can find more information to book your appointment with any of them throughout the month at the link here, which is nativestartup.org slash events. All right. Another common question that we get here at Chains Labs is how do I create a website? Until Chains Lab can go back to hosting open studio hours at our HQ in Tuba City, we will refer you to our YouTube channel. We currently have over 50 recorded sessions and discussions, each designed <clears throat> for Native business owners and all led by other Native entrepreneurs and creatives. Our workshops have covered topics like social media marketing, website design, and doing business on the, on the Navajo Nation. It's a growing archive and has a lot of shared knowledge from other natives who really just want to see our native people and their businesses thrive. To access many of our past sessions and our listings of resources, such as grants and other informational events, I'll refer you to our link here, nativestartup.org slash resources. And we do update this page pretty regularly. So please check in every now and then <clears throat> for upcoming opportunities. Another great resources resource we have to offer our social media are our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and I do recommend you check those pages out for regular postings as well. Uh, Chains Labs likes to share posts from many of our partners and others on our networks for great opportunities and resources, resources that we think are useful to our native entrepreneurs, creatives, and business owners alike. And lastly, there's a whole spectrum of who are considered native entrepreneurs. And here at Chains Labs, we've been curating our own list of them. If you're in the market for finding other native service providers who can help you with your business, we currently have over 600 native owned businesses listed there. And we think it's a really, really great resource to help start and run your business. Or maybe you're searching for some native made products. You can visit the site here at resraising.org. If you're a native business owner or entrepreneur yourself, and you have services and products that you'd like to promote, feel free to add yourself to the listing. It's free and it's a very, fairly simple process to add. Okay, so if you have any questions about Chains Labs or are interested in any of our services and would like to know where to start, feel free to email me. My email is here, raquel at nativestartup.org, and or you can visit the website at nativestartup.org as well. Now, before we start with, with our guest speaker for today, I wanna to touch base on uh, workshop etiquette and how we can be, be respectful of our guest time today. <clears throat> we do ask that you stay on mute during the presentation unless you're called upon, um, but do please feel free to populate the chat box with your questions and we'll make sure to get to them before the end of our session today. Also a reminder, our, our session is being recorded today and will be available on Chains Lab YouTube channel later this week. All right. 
Now, moving on to our guest for today, <clears throat> we have Mr. Brett Isaac of Navajo Power PVC. Uh, Brett is born on Navajo lands. He was born on Navajo lands. He's of the Towering House clan, born from an assault clan, and as a graduate of Arizona State University. Brett returned home in his, to his home community, starting his first off-grid solar, off solar company, Shanto Energy, which installed over 200 residential solar units in remote parts of the Navajo Nation. He co-founded Navajo Power and currently serves as the executive chairman. <clears throat> he is leading the effort to help tribal nations catalyze and maximize economic development and benefits from clean energy projects. Navajo Power is an indigenous-owned, mission-driven company committed to developing clean energy solution to create a positive economic change <clears throat> for tribal lands. He is a 2021 Unreasonable Fellow and a member of the 2022 GRIST 50 list. That's a very, very impressive intro. <laughs> but um, thank you everyone for, for being here. Thank you for Brett for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Brett. And good morning to everyone. Thank you all for being here. Got there. Uh, good uh, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Brett Isaac. Uh, just like um, uh, my sister Raquel said, Ki ani neshlena shein pashish chini kis ani neshetchela tova neshenela. Uh, my mom is from a place called Baby Rocks. My dad is from Shanto on the Navajo Nation. I'm sure most people know somewhat where those places are. Uh, I grew up in uh, Kienta. My mom, a teacher, my dad, uh, heavy equipment operator and foreman. Um, pretty much the only time I went off the reservation was to go to school. I went to Arizona State University um, and came back home essentially with the ambition that everyone thinks that they're going to come home with is I got this degree now give me my job, you know, and quickly found out no one will hire you because they want 20 years experience. I don't even have that today. So I, I still couldn't get a job if I applied today, but you know, I, uh, essentially kind of, you know, was molded by that experience of always seeing some barrier to getting somewhere, you know, it's always like, when you grow up in these indigenous communities, you have a chip on your shoulder because it almost seems like at every layer, there's some barrier, you know, whether it be to get an education, you know, you have to walk <laughs> to your bus stop or, you know, you have to find a school that works for you and travel. You have to do chores early in the morning or you have to, you know, spend late nights, you know, taking care of livestock when you should be doing homework. You know, there's always like sacrifices that we essentially, you know, internalize um, to be able to live the lives we wanted to, but also to create the quality of life that we had, you know, essentially um, sought out to, to really, really um, make, you know, uh, I guess to, to, to will into fruition. And that's kind of the approach like I took to, to business was essentially like I grew up, you know, in a place where at the time we didn't have like a nice hardware store. So when you broke something, good luck, you know, two hours driving somewhere to go get a replacement or you just learn how to make it, you know, and, and, you know, I always say my first job was holding a flashlight for my dad, you know, and I spent 20 years chasing cattle, horses, sheep around you know, learned how to fabricate and do electrical work, working with my uncles, you know, I was a ranch hand, a sheep herder, a water hauler, a mechanic, you know, all by the time I was in high school, I had done so many different things because we had to, you know, there wasn't an option of, you know, we'll hire the plumber, you know, on Angie's bus, you know, <laughs> until res rising, there wasn't a list of businesses that you could go out and seek that provided services. And it's still someone like that today, you know, and, and the creation of, you know, my story to get to Neville Power really starts out like being told no a lot, you know, everywhere I went, there was some obstacle and it started almost internal with people that we um, kind of surrounded ourselves with, you know, I remember going to, you know, school and, and you know, it was always something, you know, that I, I felt like a challenge to the authority of is just why couldn't we have these things that we're dreaming about? Why couldn't we, 
you know, seek the places I wanted to go. You know, I was a football player in high school, so why couldn't I go to a D1 university? And part of the challenge was there was two things that I really noticed. There's one, we didn't have like roadmaps put in place for us. So everything we're doing feels very pioneering. We're, we're the first of our kind. We're the first doing this. I mean, it seems like we're constantly breaking barriers in our generations. That was challenging because no one wants to be the first. They don't want to be the highlight of something or the guinea pig, you know, but in some cases we kind of have to be. And when I came back from college, you know, the first thing I heard I, I was, no, you can't have this job. <laughs> you don't have enough experience. Went to Navajo Nation and said, hey, I want to work here. It's like, you know, well, you might be overqualified. You have, you have these things and we can't afford to pay you. I said, well, where do I fit? So I spent six months, you know, uh, basically hauling water and tending to livestock until I eventually, you know, was given a small chance in Shanto. Um, the community of Shanto had really put together this robust plan. At the time, the council delegate was Jonathan Ned, so our, right now a former president. He was kind of younger, ambitious person leading this initiative to try to really rethink diversification because Shanto was at the base of Black Mesa. And at the time, we knew our economies were very dependent on the resources that created our jobs. You know, we were coal communities. And so they wanted to really find a way to get around that. And that is the whole reason entrepreneurship came up for me was what can we do alternatively? And I remember sitting in on meetings with them and listening to these leaders really talk about, you know, what they wanted to do for their communities. But then they would go places and again, they would hear, no, you know, you can't do that. You know, you, you wanna build this road? No, that's our money, you have to build it this way. You wanna go and do that. I mean, it seemed like, again, in every place, there was, uh, there was someone else making decisions. And I very soon got to realize that other people were determining our destiny, were determining what we could do, our potential, were limiting us because we didn't have autonomy to make decisions that we wanted to do. The first part of it was we didn't have finances. You know, it's like when you don't have an income, you're kind of subject to wherever you're getting capital from. You know, as a kid, it's your parents, you know, and you're asking for money to go to the movies. <laughs> Mom, dad decide whether or not you go to the movies. When you get old enough, you know, you decide you want to do it, you realize how hard it is you have to work to make that money to be able to go to the movies. And so you stop going to the movies. <laughs> you know, it's like there's, there's this correlation between knowing what it costs and knowing what the actual benefit is. But for me, one of the things that I've soon just really started kind of feeling was this sentiment that we needed to get on the other side of that table. As a business person, you know, you don't want to be subject to you know the environment you don't want your ecosystem to to really be that controlling of what the outcome of your business is meaning like if it's something you can produce you want to bet on yourself you don't want some other element impacting whether or not you can make capital and so you know with shanto the whole idea there was diversification looking at our economies and, and our communities the second was really analyzing the quality of life of our people. You know, we wanted to make meaningful impact by doing certain things that, you know, like looking at jobs differently, looking at tourism, looking at what people were doing to make money. So very early on, you know, this was in my mid twenties, you know, I started with Shanta and I was able to kind of get into essentially which, what was an institution that was doing what Change Labs does now which is what is it that drives our economy? What are people doing to influence it and how can we assist them? So, you know, that government at that time really was kind of forward thinking and saying, we got to do something now because we won't realize it until 10 years down the road. And if you look in that community Shanta now, like they have a gas station, a hotel, and a large part of that was due to the planning that was done 10, 15 years ago. The goal of what I set out to do once I learned how to do those things was it shouldn't take 20 years to build a gas station. You know, it shouldn't take 15 years to develop things. And again, looking at what was the, the driving factor for that? And it came back again to finances. You know, I kept hearing from 
institutions from our own government you know if it's if it's federal dollars these are the rules if it's state dollars these are the rules if it's a grand dollar these are the rules if it's the bank's dollars these are the rules you know nor in there in all of our planning in all these communities that i was able to and, 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 you know um help to work with was there ever a revenue plan no one, all of our planning, you know, and as a business, that's the first thing you do is how do I get autonomy? How do I get out of under someone else? So I can make the best decisions and I can take the risks I want to take because I know what I need to do for my operation. And again, you start realizing these factors, they're systemic. They're not just one-offs and they're not just because we don't know any better. It's because there were systems put into place. You know, this is where we get conspiracy theorists, but, you know, our economies aren't just an accident. You know, there was a large amount of influence that was weighed over our people that essentially carries that weight that helps or that kind of impacts the way that, you know, our businesses operate. You guys feel that. I know you do because you can't just go to the bank and say, hey, I have this great idea. Here's my plan. You know, come here, check, let's do business. If that were possible, because it's possible in FLAG, you can go to the credit union, say, I got this idea, I live on this street over here. More than likely, say, yeah, I'll take a chance on you. Well, Spargo, you know, we'll kick you out the door. <laughs> you know, they won't even consider that part of it. And then we don't have our own institutions that support the back end of that. You know, we have, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but we have RBDOs, you know, we have, you know, government institutions, that were given very shaky foundations to work off of, you know, and the workers that work there, I know have really good hearts, but the ability to execute is very different than the ambition. You know, you can try and think all day long, I want to do better, but you got to execute for people to believe in it. And as these elements started kind of appearing as I was going through these little journeys of understanding business and local economies, I started to see what I wanted to do and how I wanted to shape my profession. You know, I've been very, very fortunate, you know, <laughs> like that when I returned home from the Navajo Nation, I really haven't landed in a nine to five job. You know, I haven't had a nine to five job since college. And, you know, I always tell people my resume is horrible if you look at it, because, you know, right before Shanto and all this economic development, it was Toys R Us. You know, before that was Radio Shack, <laughs> before that was uh, Hollywood Video. By the way, none of those companies exist anymore. So if you want to do research on me, you can't find that company that, you know, was in existence <laughs> back then. And it, but but I but I say that to kind of say, like, you know, I also did the things I had to do, you know, when I was in college to to learn about, you know, life and business. You know, the educational piece was helpful. But the experience of it, being able to like, you know, work in different industries and make an impact, you know, the, the best thing my, my parents gave me was, you know, the ability to do hard work, you know, to, to really wake up every day with some intent on doing something. You know, I always feel guilty if I sleep too long or even if I take, take a nap during the day, then, you know, it's, it's not a part of what we do when we grow up in those areas because there's always something to do. And that's the way I felt about business is there's something to do. And even though I wasn't inside these institutions, such as our government, such as our, you know, our public systems or our schools, I felt, well, what can I do differently? And the entrepreneur side started to look at different things. I was blessed to find solar. You know, one of the things when I landed in Shanto that really stuck out to me was that of all the needs that we have, you know, all of them had barriers to entry. You know, if I wanted to start a bank, I'd need millions of dollars. If I wanted to get into natural gas or coal mining, I'd need like billions of dollars to get plants going. If I wanted to start solar, I just needed one house. You know, I needed one solar panel, one battery. And essentially that's how I took it. And my philosophy to business is almost like, I look at other things, just very observant of it. And, you know, I always kind of tell other entrepreneurs, like McDonald's didn't start with 10 restaurants, you know, they started with one. They had a system they put into place and unfortunately it was stolen from them if you've ever seen the movie, but 
the idea was just like you had an idea of working out a system that was unique and different, you know, by taking the elements around you and solving a solution that people don't know that there's a solution for. And so for me, the electrification of homes was more than just putting power into communities. It was actually the ability and power of bringing something to people who have never had the experience of that being resolved. And, and I say this because there's a unique thing in just being able to flip a light switch in your home. You know, I always say like one of the best things that I do that I don't take any pictures of is when I used to build solar units for homes, the moment you invite the family member in and say, hey, try that light or open that fridge and they see that light turn on and there's no generator running, there's nothing else in there, but it's your solar unit. You know, from that moment on, they're then changed because they've been waiting 30 years, 40 years, 50 years for power. They were told it would never happen or would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. And me, you know, in my backyard with a little bit of technical experience can bring a resource that resolves that. Like that's entrepreneurship. It's being able to do something that people don't believe can be done and create a value around that. But I have my own social reasons for doing that. It's because every time I did that, I started to realize, you know, that <clears throat> there was more to business. There's more to economies. There's more to this idea of capitalism than profit. You know, that wasn't the driving factor that never drove what I would do because, you know, ideally I never put it as a metric on the wall. It was just, can I afford to keep going? was always a thing because there's always another juncture, another venture. And, you know, of all the things that led up to Navajo Power, <clears throat> the, the, the first like element that really tipped the scale for me was that social mission to create products that serve, you know, that, that actually solve solutions, um, but that are not tied or tethered to elements I can't control. The ability to produce your own power, to put it in your front yard or your backyard, you know, and to have an independent source and to do transactions one-to-one, -one, those are all ideas of autonomy. Those are all controls that are within your grasp. And that eliminates the need to go through elements that don't understand what you're doing. Um, and of course, I got the questions when I first started, what does NTA think of you? You know, I don't think they thought much of me in the beginning. And, and now I meet with them and I think, you know, I might be coming a small threat to them, but it's not trying to challenge what they're doing. It's resolving an issue that we all have at our, you know, the back of our mind is how do we get services to people? And so ultimately going forward, you know, after resolving those first few things, you know, you get to a point where you, um, as a business owner, I started looking at what it was that was going to be the next venture. You know, it's like as an entrepreneur and, you know, if, if this is you right now, don't don't feel bad about it. But you always feel like you can do more, do better or there's something else you can do. Even when you create something good, you know, you can have some product and it's just it's never done. It's an ever evolving thing to be able to go and, and move forward with that, that part. Um, I really wanted to make sure that Navajo Power, you know, at least this concept of it, you know, was was kind of rooted in, in the service of what we were doing versus the idea of it being some sort of profit monster. The, uh, the, um, the real story of it, you know, kind of starts again at, I had done all this off-grid work and I had kind of created a bit of a name for myself. I went to Standing Rock and we built solar for up there. I flew to Alaska, built solar out there. You know, I started to become known for taking on challenges that other people wanted. You know, they'd say, can you build a solar unit in a month and drive it to Fairbanks, Alaska? I did that, you know. They didn't know if I could, but I did. Um, it was always like the, the challenges that no one else would want to take on or at least like that they felt like were a little crazy to do. 
and I kind of adopted a bunch of buddies that had the similar, <laughs> that had similar things and, I, and I'd have them tag along with me. Um, but at a certain point, it kind of grew very like, um, like it was one house at a time, two houses at a time, three houses at a time, one project at a time. I started to see the growing need and the gap in getting there. And so I was at this point where I had kind of outgrown what I was doing then. And I was living in my family's ranch in Baby Rocks. All this happened on the res, by the way. Like I wasn't in Phoenix or even Flagstaff. All this happened in the dirt in the backyard of Baby Rocks. So, you know, I always hear people, you know, really, you know, there used to, there is an area that it's very hard to start a business on an animation. And it is, I'm not, I'm not saying that it isn't, but it's not impossible, you know. Um, I took some scrap metal, some fabrication knowledge. My dad's all welder and a set of sockets and started my first company. You know, I, I had a little bit of capability and those first systems, I went back and redid them a year later because the first ones were really bush league looking and. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to leave those out there and have that people say, you did this. But, um, you know, the first customers I had that I did on, under solar, I still am connected to them today. And I've never had to do any kind of marketing for anything that I do. Well, I guess we do now at Naval Power. But, you know, I built a really a reputation around projects, you know. I also shy away from, like, doing interviews and photos and stuff because I don't want it to be it's not about me it's not about you know the person that's doing this it's about the delivery of projects the execution of something and so I got to really connect with a few um I guess we'll call them like um comrades in this space and one of them was this Jewish kid from New Jersey named Dan Rosen and Dan had gotten to know the Navajo Nation um, out of college or out of high school. He ended up, you know, tagging along to with a, a couple of, um, you know, uh, I guess people that I know and activists talking about, you know, climate change and conservation on the Navajo Nation. Then he eventually wandered out to the Bay and started what now is a multi billion dollar finance company. Um, but at the time, he was in a similar place. Um, he had started that company and essentially grew a little, like, you know, a little, he, he had outgrown what he essentially started and was looking to do something different. And so in 2017, we were starting to kind of get together. He'd come out to Flagstaff, I'd go out to the Bay and we'd talk about opportunities. And really, originally, we were talking about homes, like how can we power more homes? What can we do to accelerate this? He had a finance company, I had technical experience. Then one day we had a, um, we we're at a ceremony, a Kinaga coming of age ceremony for one of our, our friend's daughters. And we got, you know, we were the ones watching the fire. And so two in the morning, we're putting logs on, drinking coffee, you know, rolling, rolling tobacco. And it's in Shanto. And you can see the coal train going through the valley there because um, we were up above it and we're looking. And we started talking about transition. You know, we were in this place ourselves, but also we were looking at our economy on the Navajo Nation. And we we're looking at essentially our our ecosystem globally and saying that you know we needed to be in the front of pushing how development of clean technology and clean energy would be embraced if we wanted it to be beneficial to our communities we also knew that if you know indigenous people really wanted you know to have an equitable seat at the table they would have to be at the table and so we started talking about developing our projects. So why don't we, why couldn't we do it? You know, why couldn't we go and build one of the biggest solar farms in the world? Why, why not us? Now, for a lot of people, that sounds ambitious. And I've heard a lot of people say, I want to do this. You know, there's a huge gap between I want to do this. And then, you know, all of a sudden sitting in front of an investor, trying to raise capital on an idea. 
the first year of Navajo power was really based off of the previous 10 years of myself, of Dan, of, you know, there was Josh and Tony, they're also with us. There was four original founders. As a business, you know, you kind of pick the way you want to start, but really you're trying to sell an objective, you know, whether it's to yourself to believe that you can make these things and productize it and have a successful, sustainable operation. Or in our case, it's making a case, making a narrative that we can solve a solution that is much grander than anybody else had ever kind of looked to tackle, especially private enterprise, you know? And so at the time, I think I was like 32. Um, I feel old now, but 32 years old, sitting there thinking about starting a, a business like this. And again, I've, I've had the, the, the successes before, but they're, they're minimal compared to this. And so what I really wanted to focus on when I was thinking about this was saying, one, can I do this? Like, the first, I would say the first four weeks of, of this conversation was really me kind of almost like shrugging it off when Dan would say, we should do this, you know? And I owe a lot to him because he gave me the initial confidence to say that, no, we can, we can find the people that would invest in this. We can actually go out, you know, as entrepreneurs. And again, this is me sitting in Baby Rocks, you know, thinking about, can I start this large organization that I know is going to cost millions of dollars to do? And I've never seen that kind of money before. Like I've never really dealt with, you know, the type of capital that that is going to do. And, you know, I don't have family that's done that. I don't have a pathway to get anywhere close to that. I don't even know where you start, but I had this kid that was a little ambitious that had known some people. And so we put together an advisory board of a very, very prominent, you know, individuals. One of them used to head a company called SunPower. And so he had been a president of a multi-billion dollar organization. And he just liked what we were doing. He said, yeah, there's all I'll advise you guys. Another had incubated businesses globally and essentially had been responsible for starting over 200 clean tech companies. And then we got some culture advisors, some people that, you know, could keep us grounded and rooted from thinking too corporate about what we're doing and instead focusing back on the indigenous aspects of why we're doing development. You know, it's like this is the natural step in the growth of us into this operation. We, for the first year of Navajo Power, were essentially what I call profit as a business owner, as, as someone who's going to seek capital, when you don't have a product or a map to show somebody, you essentially are selling a vision. You know, you're selling a dream. You're selling some idea somewhere down the road that could potentially happen. And if you aren't on par, if you aren't accurate and, and compelling and ambitious, those investors within the first five minutes will shut off, you know, turn up the lights and say, hey, you know, maybe go to the next one. The first thing we had to do was get capital, like just to afford what we're doing. Can't do any kind of work without a business. And, you know, this is where I get into the business culture of this thing is like your first hundred thousand dollars are really, really hard. I'll say that to get to a hundred thousand dollars of initial capital is, is a really hard thing, but then you scale up. Then you go to raising your first 250000 then to your next million. You know, in the span of Naval Power's existence, that's what I've been able to do. You know, this kid who was working at Toys R Us 10, 12 years ago, you know, and, and kind of figuring, bouncing my way around. You know, I got the MBA that I was always wanting to go back and get starting this business because we were able to create a prophecy of what we were doing as a business. And the idea is that Navajo Power is set up as a public benefit corporation to maximize the benefits for the communities we develop projects in. We really early set this mission up because one, we needed something to, you know, really kind of create our soul with. The second is we needed something that people would invest in. What do people invest in as a business, you know? You can be a very, very, you know, um, 
um, charismatic person, but essentially investors will strip all that away and eventually look at what it is the core that you're doing and what's the value of it. So it's like you can create all the slide decks in the world, the business plan, the performance, you can guess all the information in it. The end of the day, they want to know that you're the one that's going to execute on this and you have the capability to get there. And so, again, those first years was us proving through a couple of different concepts. One, there's a market. Travel nations are places you can do business. The second is like creating an investable space. When Naval Power does its work, the idea is that we're making travel communities investable. You know, we have multiple hundred million dollar projects on tribal lands across the West today. You know, we're not just developing <laughs> one house, one home. You know, we're creating a system for investors that invest on that scale to be able to land in our communities, to be, a, to be neighbors with who we are. So we knew we had to be careful with that. The idea of creating this business was like trying to open our borders up and our ecosystem up so that we could generate the resources we knew were not present at the time. And that's what's really been like the most, I guess, earth shattering part for me is prior to us doing this, you know, I didn't know of any other business that really thought that way that said, well, we can do this from home. You know, we don't have to go and find some big company and bring them back and then become a part of their management. You know, when I looked at the operations that were operating in our communities, I looked at like Peabody, I looked at, you know, I even looked at all of our energy companies, NTUA, Intech, you know, um, the biggest problem I saw in those things, the thing that always bothered me is you never see Navajos in the C-suite of those companies. You know, has there been a Navajo, you know, who's leading into a right now, you know, dude from Chicago, you know, who's leading in tech right now, some other white guy that did coal somewhere else, um, whoever, you know, Peabody, we had plenty of talented people come through these institutions, but never able to reach the management level, the, the decision making level of those companies. And so I felt if we were going to do renewable energy, that's what we had to do is get people in those positions and really strive for that level of, of capability is we want to play with the next eras, the AES is the, you know, in our business, we compete with companies that have billions of dollars of assets internationally, you know, and so how can we do that? How is it possible that we can do that from the position we are? It's because we have a product a mission and a different set of capabilities than any of those companies can provide. We found the niche that the businesses that were coming to our communities couldn't do. We've seen plenty of companies come and strike out on tribal land to know that money isn't the only challenge you have to overcome. There's a lot of nuances to working in indigenous communities. And so I think that, you know, we really opened the door at the right time because we started to see where we could play a role and where we were more valuable. We're, you know, hiring indigenous people, hiring, you know, these, these different talents. We're going to maximize their capabilities, not just to generating, you know, a profession, but to actually contributing back to their communities. And so the work that we do, the work that we bring in, essentially the, the first objective is essentially like we are a team, you know, Naval Power is a thing. It's not an individual, we're all replaceable. We all have, you know, different priorities and objectives, but we have a service back to communities. As a public benefit corporation, you set up this social mission. So maximizing community benefits is more than just a concept. It's more than just dollars. You know, that's one thing that I think business owners really, um, or I guess me as a business owner, like you don't really think about how much that costs, you know, like to um, not just try to keep yourself afloat, but come up with some side hustles that you have to now deliver on because you opened your mouth and said, I can do these things. And so that's where we're at with, with this operation now is like, you know, we 
are trying to do it differently because it needs to be done differently. If we're going to change the paradigm. Energy is going to be non-extractive and beneficial to our communities, it's got to be a part of us. It's got to be something that has our DNA built into it. And so that's one of the reasons we started the company is it, this was necessary, even if it is influencing other companies to copy what we do, we set the bar. We say, this is what communities need and what they deserve. And if you can match it or exceed it, good on you, because that's all we're really after when we started this thing is we wanted to make sure that there was an elevated level of standard for development in tribal communities. We also wanted to make sure that we understood the business. You know, all the other forms of operation, and, and unfortunately, I think we're even seeing this with our helium production right now on the Navajo Nation. We made all those decisions under duress. There was always some counterpart that was forcing us because either we were economically tr in trouble, we needed capital, we needed something we could do, or we didn't have the profession or the experience, or we weren't in a decision-making posture. Someone else was influencing us. So we wanted to make development a part of this idea about providing education, so providing a broader framework for how we do this work. That goes back you know, to again, those early days working in Shanto and being told you can't do that. And I didn't know whether or not I could not or couldn't, you know, I didn't know if we could afford financing. I didn't, business-wise, there was nothing. There was, there was no, you know, understanding of anything. I just kind of took what was kind of given to me in as an answer. Today, when someone tells me no, it just sets off a chain of events of me trying to find a way around that no. You know, and as an entrepreneur, like, I think that's the one thing I always try to, like, really impart is like, you know, we're not ones to take no the first, second, or third time. You know, we got to find our ways around those barriers because somewhere in that process is a product, is an initiative, is, is, is something that actually creates value for you. So, you know, that was part of Navajo Power's idea is just like, who was going to tell us no, that we couldn't do this work, that we couldn't do these things. Our whole business is based on getting permission, getting consent, and getting regulatory approval. Like, if you look at our product, it's essentially getting signatures, you know, proving that these things work, and then taking them to you know, a financing capability and saying, hey, we have this product, here's all the people that signed on and we're going to put it out to market as as simple as our business is now getting those permissions getting those consents that's the other difficult part about this business you know it's like it's if you've ever tried to get a home at least in the Navajo Nation or if you ever tried to do anything you know you realize like you know it's not just one signature and then someone signs off and two weeks later you get yourself a, a lease. It's like 40 years of arguing with relatives and trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> how to how to get something that's just as simple as, OK, you can do that. You know, that's that's the simple answer you're looking for. I, you know, well, let me look at time real quick. I really wanted to make a company that reflected my you know, not only my, but the group's perspective on simplicity of what we're doing. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. It doesn't have to be shrouded in mystery. We are very simply developing projects that we want to bring benefits back to communities. Of course, we have to be profitable. We have to bring, we have to put food on our tables. You know, we have to take the investment of others and give them a return. But in doing so, we're challenging the standards of how this business can be done. But also we're challenging kind of a, a whole paradigm on communities that have been essentially abandoned, you know, various times by business and by in, in industry. Everyone gives up really quickly because it is hard. And there are barriers that make it extremely difficult to get through. We don't have that luxury of giving up on these operations. You know, we have to get through them because on the other side of that barrier is all the information, all the autonomy, all those things that in our utopias 
all that vision building that we do as communities in our planning, all that our families kind of look for in sustainable, you know, employment, food on the table, better education, jobs, all of that is on the other side of that barrier. And so we see that as a challenge to get through as a business to that part. And two reasons for me, one, to prove you don't have to do this from afar. You can be at home. You know, you don't have to have, you know, three doctorates and a whole bunch of formal education. Um, the other is like, you know, I, I really reflect back on being a kid and looking at what my options were. You know, like what, what was I going to be when I grew up? And when I reflected back then, like there wasn't kids that signed up saying, I want to be Navajo Nation president or I want to be head of NTUA. Like you don't hear that in our communities, you know, they want to be like bull riders and, you know, lawyers, engineers, but, you know, there's no job for bull riders on the nation. There's very few jobs for lawyers, very few jobs for engineers, you know, so when I thought about it, it was, I just wanted to create opportunities. That was like what I wanted to do when I, when I grew up. And so as I got older, the place I found that in was being an entrepreneur. It was like, that was the place for me to land that I could use all this information that I had to be able to resolve the challenges that I'm looking at when I see our communities, you know, face, you know, difficult decisions, you know, in, in some of our communities, it's the, the difference between deciding whether, you know, we fund housing for someone who really needs it or, you know, a new chapter house. Like there is all kinds of needs in our communities that entrepreneurs, by paying taxes, by creating jobs, by pitching into the local economy, can help to start to alleviate. That's that revenue plan. That's the revenue plan for these communities to be able to lift themselves out of the area, out of that, that, that desperation, that, that point that we, we don't know what to do because there's so many different issues. I've really become, you know, grateful for what we're doing because, you know, I get to hear from the outside world what this looks like as a business owner, investors, we raised $10 million in two years to, to fund our initial operations. As a business, especially on the Navajo Nation, it's not normal to do that. But we had to go and find over 30 investors that believed in what we're doing, get them to commit and to do this work. Not only that, now we have to do the work. The next thing we had to do with those investors is talk about how they're operations like not just money and going back to them but what it would do to service the community and so we had to create a community benefit model that essentially shows how we're going to benefit these areas not just by building a solar plant and putting panels on the ground that's easy i've already done that i've already put a lot of panels up the hard part is how do you convert all these things into a tangible economic movement that services communities in a way that they haven't been in a while. Again, that's turning on that light for the first time for people that have never had light. We're trying to flip an economy into a position that it's never felt, which is what happens when you give communities a revenue, when you give them an income? What do they do when they get a little bit of sustainability and you create a pathway? You show how you finance a billion dollar project. You bring in that capital to finance it. You show how you get the consent of already over 90 signatures and the permission from multiple layers of regulatory offices. You know, these are all elements that we know we have to get through as business owners. You know, we know how difficult it is just to get a lease. We're, we've taken that and we've blown it up to a large scale. So you know, we're doing this again on levels that are competing with some of the biggest operations in the world. And it's only at that level that I feel we can really show that we are a place, you know, that, that has these capabilities and potential. And so, you know, the, the last part of my kind of journey and vision of creating this company 
was we just needed to be an economic driver that was different. You know, we, we wanted to be more favorable back to these regions that we serve and to be thankful, you know, that we're able to get their permission to be neighbors, to be in their community, to provide services, to provide jobs, all the different things that come with it. Um, but to actually plan ourselves as neighbors, you know, I, I, um, I, I've always had like in kind of a, an idea and a vision that at some point, you know, when we wanted to do something in our community, we would just vote on it and decide and we get done. You know, that's when I think I'll be done is when we wanted to build a road, the money's there, the decision making's there, the job's there, the technical experience is there. You know, when we get to those levels of being able to provide things that we need and to have total autonomy over those decisions is essentially when I think Naval Power will have achieved what it is that it's seeking out to do, which is create projects that change how communities think about development. Uh, and then lastly, you know, kind of as a word, and there's a couple of change labs, I'm not sure how many, uh, new cohort members are on here, but, you know, this is a culmination of a lot of work for me, but it's not, you know, inaccessible. Networking has been one of the greatest tools that I've ever had, you know, at my disposal. There's a large world out there. There's a large network of people rooting for initiatives like yours and like mine. They're looking for places to put capital. They're looking for projects to deliver on. And we need to get better about networking with our own spaces. I'm always available, you know, as limited time as I have, I always make sure I take the time to talk to other entrepreneurs and other people because the only way we, we solve the, you know, spectrum of issues is collaboratively. There are some things that you guys have out there that I need. There are some things that you guys have that I can help you find, but it doesn't happen if we are constantly at odds with each other, we have a real problem with scarcity in our communities. There's a belief that if you get something, I don't get it. And it's run rampant through our communities. And we see that as the challenge to like growing wealth and growing generational change is we got to get into that mind frame of we should get behind our brightest stars and push them as hard as we can forward. And we should collaborate and spread out the benefactor, the benef the benefits that we have managed to conjure together. And I always kind of open Navajo Power's, you know, width of capabilities, information, even just discussions to other like-minded folks. And I invite you, like we have opportunities if you want, if you're looking for something, you know, we're pretty ambitious in what we're doing. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, the, the message really is, I would not have been able to start Navajo Power without my networking being the way that it was, without meeting those people, without being able to go to investors, without being able to really take on, again, a grander concept and, and think that it was possible, you know, we're not where we want to be, you know, we're still on our way there. But just seeing what the team has been able to do, I'm so proud of the people that we brought in. There are some of the most committed and dedicated and just compassionate folks that we have that are meticulously delivering on what it is that we want to do. And I've been very blessed and fortunate, you know, to kind of share this story in, in a lot of different places. But the, the place that it resounds most, you know, interesting enough is with other indigenous communities international. You know, I'm talking to in Australia up in Canada. You know, they wonder why at home, like it's hard for us to do work. They're like, I'm Navajo, is it easy for you to do anything? I said, no, I said, I'm Navajo. <laughs> you know, if I wasn't Navajo, I don't know. It might be easier for me to do work on Navajo. That's just something I've kind of thought about. But I said, but the difference is those, like, I know that that needs to change and I'm working on that. I'm working on trying to build hope with our communities so that we're, we're kind of taking our approach a bit more, you know, holistically across indigenous nations. 
Um, and then lastly, I'll just end, you know, on the fact that, you know, we're doing all this development work. We have projects that will benefit these communities. And essentially me being a founder and, and, and kind of like the, I guess, the head of this, you know, we're committed to seeing all this stuff through, you know, and development takes a long time and it's really difficult work, but, you know, I, I encourage people to ask us questions, you know, attend our sessions. We're very open about what we do. By the time someone figures out how to do what we do, we're doing something different. There's no reason for us to hide or to, to not disclose. And again, it's all about this opportunity. Like we're doing what is necessary to get our projects done. Um, and with that, I do better with questions when I'm talking. So I'll turn it back to Raquel and see if there's any uh, questions out there. But uh, yeah, thank you guys. All right, sure. thank you, Brett. <clears throat> there is one question in the chat box so far. It says from Delphina Bigay. Uh, she says, hello, Brett, how many employees do you currently have on staff and then do they work remotely? We have 13 currently on staff and yes, I have employees in New York, Mexico, Oregon, California, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. And we have projects across the, the Western US. Ooh. And then we have Tim from Chains Labs who says, besides large scale solar projects, are you doing more solar projects for housing these days? Oh, I forgot to talk about another business that we do. <laughs> so um, Naval Power launched a subsidiary called Naval Power Home last year. We did a pilot. So off grid, always a challenge, energy access. The number they throw out is 15,000 homes need power in the Naval Nation. You know, being that we're doing our project in one of our large projects in the Bennett Freeze, I've seen that firsthand. There are hundreds of homes that we drive by every day. You know, if you drive through Cameron, there's there's many, many homes that still need electrification. Navajo Power Home is a residential solar as a service company that we created and it's built off of years of experience of us. And we have a joint joint venture partner called Ilu Mexico. They've done off-grid in Mexico. Um, They've got 25,000 systems down there and they're helping us with our back office. But we created a staff of two Navajo, all Navajo um, uh, installer teams. And since August, they've installed on 80 homes on the Navajo Nation. We will we'll close in on 200 by hopefully April, May, 300 by the end of summer. Um, the goal is in the next five years to get to 5,000 homes of, of service for that company. And it's unsubsidized. You know, we essentially raised our own capital um, and we created our own loan system. So one of the limitations to off-grid was lending. How do you lend to get it more affordable for people? And so we, um, we created a lending program that, you know, we essentially set the rules for. So we don't use traditional FICO credit scores. We use a social credit system that essentially just analyzes his ability to pay. Then we work with our customers. So we have a metering system that allows you to do what we call, it's, it's kind of like pay as you go. So you can pay, you don't have to pay the whole month. You can pay for one week, one day. You can pay day to day if you want to. And every time you make a payment, um, we have a processing system with Stripe. But you make a payment, we text you a code, you enter the code on your system, and it gives you power for that day. Um, but we tried to auto, not automate, but create um, a product that was more user-friendly. And it's been well-received. Um, again, being that we powered 80 homes, um, we're going to do 200 homes with about maybe $1.5 million of capital. Um, if you look at the alternatives, you know, and I'm looking at like ARPA funds. I've seen some chapters planned for um, power line extensions and solar panel. You're looking at millions of dollars to power like a hundred homes. You know, we can do a hundred homes in a million dollars. So, you know, we're really trying to bring down that cost and, and again, challenge the system. What are the options out there? So we created a product that is independent because we control how it's financed and we control those solutions. And then we're independent of any other system that you know could tell us, well, you can't service those people and these people. We get to decide where, where we wanna be the most of service to. So 
um, look out for it. NavalPowerHome.com if you want to learn more about that. And then also Navalpower. Power. And then next question we have from Shana Roanforce. Have you done projects in New Mexico and, or off reservation? So for the residential, yes, both, both, both of them. I've done off-grid projects out there in Van der Wagen and up in the Four Corners. We are working on development projects, large-scale utility projects. Um, I think the one that's disclosed is in Tetacon chapter. Um, we have a multi, multi, I think it's like 400 megawatt project we're working on there. And then across the river, we're working on another one, but that one we haven't decided yet. Um, and then uh, we do have projects up in Oregon, Southern California, Southern Arizona. So we are working in multiple areas. And I think it was in New Mexico and Nevada. We have one more in Nevada we just added on. And then I think I'm going to go in order of questions. I'll call on Albert. He has his hands up for a verbal question. Albert Husky. Right. He's one of our incubator members currently. Yeah, um, so I wrote down my questions so I don't forget what I was asking. Um, all right, uh, can you tell us about a time during your venture about a problem you came across and had to solve? Uh, what did you do during that moment and how did you handle it? Um, can you give us a glimpse of what, like how someone like us could handle such problems? One thing I really harp on is leadership in our company. Um, you know, growing up, Usually it's our parents that are be, become the, the reliable ones we look at. Like, I always say this, like, a leader is someone that if you broke down in your car, you'd be the first person to call because, you know, they figure something. Even if they know what to do, they figure it out. You know, in, in, in becoming an entrepreneur, you deal with, you become everything. You know, you become not only like a business person, but a mentor, a coach, you know, sometimes a therapist. And you have to intermediate conflicts in your company. One of the biggest things when you start creating teams is learning how to build everyone up. And so the way that I've done that, and I've been very fortunate with this, uh, it was mentioned, you know, there are incubators out there like Change Labs, but there's other ones, uh, accelerators. The Unreasonable Network is an accelerator for, they call them like mid-stage, growth stage ready companies. So these are companies that have raised, you know, $10 million plus. But in that, there's a group of CEOs that all get executive coaching that I that I still receive today. You know, we're not done as human beings and we're not done as business owners and as leaders. Consistently, you need to update leadership style. You know, consistently, you need to know whether or not you're being effective and your team is following you. And so the only way to do that is essentially to ensure you're auditing yourself as a leader to make sure you're making good decisions, you have the trust of your folks. And, you know, you can see that kind of come back to you in the form of like work and all those other things. So I would say like being able to resource things and looking to a broader, you know, again, like a, a network of resources has been very beneficial because I'm so used to the scarcity of being islanded and I always say, like, uh, business owners on Navajos are like Rambo, like it's one man versus the world, it seems like, all the time. And that's how I used to run my first business. It's like I felt like Rambo, one knife, you know, trying to challenge an army. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, there are resources, there are peer networks, there are groups out there that can really help you, one, you know, kind of dilute some of the challenges you face, but the other is making sure that again, like you're you're keeping up with the most relevant way of doing things. You know, that's one of the cultures that's I would, you know, I'm very supportive of is this networking capability for business owners to vent to each other and come up with techniques to be able to help each other with problems. Um, because internally you can only do so much and there's you know, I've been advocating for 25 hours a day versus 24, but that hasn't happened yet. You know, you don't have enough time to do everything. So you have to rely on delegating and team stuff, um, as well as looking at resources. So. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next question we have is um, Leander Thomas. He has his hand up for his verbal question. Yes, uh, Brett, I was listening to your, um, your presentation there. Uh, very, very good uh, 
inspiration there about what you're doing. And uh, you mentioned uh, on your uh, when you were talking about your presentation about investors, mm -hmm. you know, how is that really important? I could see that, you know, on a, on a larger scale, you know, happening across all Navajo Nation. And I think that's one of the essentials is, you know, bringing in more investors and selling our product. And, you know, I, I really like to know. Maybe maybe talk a little more about how you got your investors. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things is like every industry has fans. Like there, there, there's groups set up, and you know, if you're in energy, if you're in clean energy, there's this network of people. There's networks all over the place of, you know, like-minded people getting. It starts there. Just getting to be able to know people in the space will then know somebody who's funded a resource, you know, who then will know another funder who's doing something. You know, there are, you know, we were very fortunate. We partnered with Indian Collective very early on. Nick Tilson from up in South Dakota essentially is one of our advisors, but they have a lot of familiarity in raising capital. And so although we still have to do a lot of the work because it's essentially us creating the materials and you know, learning how to attract investment is a skill. You know, right now, this year, I'm going to be going on a fundraising round where we're hoping to raise, you know, 20 plus million dollars. Um, it's not possible unless we do our first 50,000. So being able, it's all about scalability. You start where you're comfortable and it can be as simple as $2,000, you know, from a micro loan program, learning how the financial tools work there. But the biggest thing is being able to like, and this is a business owner like kind of responsibility is how do you tell your vision to investors that one shows your ability to deliver on it, but also gives them a place to exit. You don't want an investor sitting with you for 50 years. You know, you want to give them five years and say, okay, this is a place that you can do that. There's a lot of planning that goes into it um, in terms of like learning how to do that. But the first place is networking. And then talking to people like the folks at Indian Collective, like other funders, you know, and I would say like grants are nice and all, but they're some of the hardest parts of money to get. They're some of the most difficult things to manage. They sometimes cost you more than the money you get, you know, with them. So you also want to find pathways and there's all kinds of options out there from raising things like debt, you know, so you're raising loans and other kinds of facilities to things that are more equity-based. So you're selling a portion of your company to bring in maybe a strategic partner or an investor that sees in you. So depending on what your situation is, there are multiple avenues. Um, and really it all starts with your internal business having a formal structure to be able to say, okay, this is what we do. This is all the function of it. In five years, we'll be here. That's all you really need to get going. After that, your investors will give you enough feedback to give you that idea of what you need to improve on. And so, yeah, um, to get those 30 investors, we probably talked to 300, you know, so not everything is a win and I wouldn't get discouraged if, you know, your first even dozen don't go through. It's, it's really a numbers game when it comes to those guys. And, and the type that they are. And then there's traditional investing too. There's banks and things that loan into it. But I would really say, look into your industry network. You know, who's, who are the leads of the industry you're in? Try to get, you know, in close with them and see who finances their opportunities. Even the biggest companies in the world don't use their own money. They get investment. They use other people's capital to grow their, their opportunities. So it's not an uncommon thing to take capital in. All right, thank you, but. Next question we have is from Cassandra. She has a verbal question for you and we have about eight minutes. So hopefully we can get to everyone. We have a bunch of questions in the chat. <laughs> All right, Hi, Cassandra. Brett. Thank you. Hi, Brett. Hi, everybody. Um, I am one of the co-founders and the deputy director of the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund. And Brett, I don't know if you remember me, but I met you back in Hogback a few years ago. I worked with the Indian Collective, and I was very inspired by the work you were doing. Um, a lot of my personal story resonates with yours. I started at eight years old selling beaded keychains um, with my family as a business, and I learned 
by 10 years old, how to do marketing and to have a clientele and stuff. Um, and now at 37 years old, I helped co-found this relief fund where, you know, I am able to bring my entrepreneurial spirit. Um, <laughs> and we were able to raise about $18 million in the last three years. Uh, we used that money for direct relief um, to help Navajo and Hopi uh, communities. And then we are currently launching uh, three community centers um, on, on Navajo Nation. We've launched one in Monument Valley, Utah, and then we want, launched another in Sheep Springs, New Mexico, and then uh, we're in the process of launching a third. So our, I, our whole thing is to transition to more long-term sustainable um, work to help our communities be pandemic proof. Um, and part of this work, we are really focusing on programming around entrepreneurship cultural programming, language revitalization, food security, et cetera. So these are sort of innovation hubs that we're developing. Um, but one of the challenges that we have is diversifying our fundraising portfolio. Um, I know that these hybrid um, structures of combining like a nonprofit uh, with a for-profit enterprise is on the rise. And so I had um, several questions about this, being that we are a nonprofit, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, one, I'm interested to know if you'd like to be on our board. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm kind of not. <laughs> oh, and then secondly, um, like, do you have any experience with that process? of combining a nonprofit with a for-profit enterprise. Um, and what are your thoughts about that? Um, one, humbled by the invitation, but I think I have enough board seats that I'm filling right now. Um, I sit on just, I sit on Change Labs board as well. Um, and I run two other companies, but uh, <laughs> no, just, so my, my experience in Shanta, Shanta actually has a nonprofit community development corporation called Shanta Community Development. That's where I started. They created a for-profit called Shanta Economic Development Corporation, which is the managing entity for Shanta's gas station and, and now it's um, hotel. Um, those are kind of two arms. They're actually paired with the chapter. The chapter owns the interest in both. So it's a very unique scenario in how to do it. I like it because it gives you a lot of options. The challenge is staffing really it's hard to share definitely can't share board members because they have to be autonomous and independent but you know to staff it you can actually have like the nonprofit because i did that for a number of years where i would work for the nonprofit and contract to the profited side um it's kind of looking at it similar to like a regulated and unregulated arm of the same company and as long as you create the autonomy between the two it's usually not an issue and it gives you a lot of flexibility um, for um, um, the, the the operational side, so I, I I would encourage it if you can do it. The challenge is again the administration. If you, if you can get enough people that can help you navigate it, um, and, and again financing and funding it is is one other issue. Is we have enough people. You don't want to start something that costs you more to just keep alive than than um, to actually bring you value. So just weighing it on that. Um, we, we as a Navajo Power today, um, we have a fiscal agent relationship with a incubator. And so when we need grant uh, infusion and capital, we have a fiscal sponsor that we utilize. So there's also that hybrid arrangement too. Awesome. Thank you. I just had one more question about the investors. You said you talked to 300 investors and then out of that pipeline trickle out maybe 30. Do you just have maybe some pointers on like where we can, if we're interested in investors, like where we can look or, I know you mentioned there's a, networks, but. There's a lot of like mission investor networks, you know, like if you look up mission investors, that's usually the first, um, the first place I recommend, like, hold on. Um, I recommend kind of starting is like, uh, you know, you have like Temel Pius Trust, which is a collective of, of investors. You have the Santa Fe, I think it's called Santa Fe Community Foundation. Um, 
which is like a, a consortium of angel investors in the New Mexico, Albuquerque, Santa Fe area. Um, it's really about asking, you know, usually if you start with one investor, it can basically chain you along. Um, the other is like, we did very well in bringing in a lead. So we had a lead investor that believed in us and that did the initial diligence. They can help you bring in other, other folks. And so a lot of our success has been built on the lead investors br bridging invitations to other people. Um, so I, I kind of tap on that. And then you only want to do one form of diligence. You know, I've done 18 month diligence. I've done six month diligence. Like the shorter you can keep that, the more you can get one perspective on your company and share that and allow it to share amongst multiple investors, the easier it is to, to like get, you know, people to, to buy it. Um, but if everyone has to do their diligence on you, that means you're changing either really fast and there's a lot of material things that are going on or like you haven't built enough, like you need to find that solid first investor that's willing to advocate for you. And, and that way, as you go down the investment cycle, you know, the last investments take a shorter amount of effort and time as compared to the first. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, there's some questions. I see a lot of uranium questions popping up. I just yeah, want to have... address those really, really quickly. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that we do as a developer is we don't try to use prime land. Grazing, as well as factors like drought, have made land a challenge in any indigenous community. And so we try to pick areas that have been formally affected but are safe. Um, our project in the coal mine, uh, coal mine Canyon chapter is actually located in an area that was formerly affected by abandoned uranium mines. Now, we brought out radiologists as well as we have um, what they call a phase one environmental site assessment, which puts together our environmental planning for how we're going to address safety. Uh, we've determined, like in all of our sites, we have to make sure that our employees are safe from impact and that any regional area, so like if there's anybody around our site, um, we don't contribute to further environmental challenges. And so we're very meticulous with our planning and our permitting that we have to design systems in place um, that, that contain our in economic impact, uh, as well as, um, you know, just, you know, using personal monitoring systems on our employees. So if we have people that are going to be out there for a certain duration, there's an environmental monitoring for uranium that they'll have to wear. Um, and essentially it'll tip off that their exposure has reached uh, not a dangerous level, but a level that's elevated. You know, we, we have a threshold far below anything that's that's dangerous. Um, but yeah, I just kept seeing uranium questions popped up. So, Raquel, any other? All right, we are I, at time, but, um, and many of I, the questions I, that are in the chat box, unless you, you guys are all okay. I was gonna say, I have, I have time if you, I think I know I, you're I a busy know. person. Okay, no a lot of them are from our current incubator members. So we okay, next we sure. have Sasha Begay. She says, do you only help homes that need power and how do you feel about helping homes that want to go solar? I think that's the secondary, like, like we do wanna do that. The challenge with um, our current system on the Navajo Nation is just our utility. Our utility doesn't currently have a plan or a process for doing great interconnection. So there's really no incentive in there. Um, for my off-grid customers, when a power line gets to their residents, it, they don't allow them to choose to use both. They make them pick one or the other. And so that's been a challenge. Um, and of course, this has to be dealt with probably at the nation level. Um, NTUA has to have an incentive. Utilities like APS, SRP, the reason they do it is the state gives them some funding that says, you know, if you take this much solar, here's a tax credit or here's a benefit to it. Because NTUA doesn't have tax base or is not a regulated utility, they don't have the same incentives that, you know, the utilities around us have. So there needs to be a creation of something for us to be able to deploy solar more. That being said, um, there are options that you know we're starting to look at because resiliency is becoming an issue. We have a lot of our relatives out there who can't handle more than an hour without power because they have breathing machines, CPAPs, refrigerators, 
with medicine. And so we're thinking about solutions on how to build products, you know, that essentially can be dependable, you know, if power goes out. You know, we've experienced definitely in the last year during the pandemic how much energy affects the quality of life of folks. So it's something we have on our mind, but the first challenge for us is getting power to those that um that don't um that don't currently have it. And then we'll, you know, kind of moving from there. Okay. Next question we have from Sahar. <clears throat> She's also part of our incubator program. She says, how many intertribal collaborations will you be looking at in the next five years? A lot of we're successful. You know, right now we do work with um, eight, eight tribes that we currently have conversations and deals with. Um, really, it's, you know, it's interesting because like with the Navajo Nation, it's more like local based. So we're working with chapters and local municipalities versus like, um, a tribe up in Oregon where it's the tribal council. And it's just because their members are, you know, memberships are a little smaller. Um, we have to do a little bit of diligence on the tribe itself to make sure that we're, um, we're making sure that uh, um, they have the capabilities of, of delivering on a project. You know, the nomination is very sophisticated, very, very big, and has a lot of resources. There's some tribes that have one person offices. And so just trying to get like a legal agreement is very hard. So that limits some of our ability to work with some tribes is they just sometimes don't have the resources to, to be able to work with the project like this or, or they're working on it and they're not quite at a stage that, you know, we can be helpful to them. Thank you. And then the next one is another question from Sasha. She says, what do you do to separate work life from home and how do you take time to yourself? to not think about your business? <laughs> kind of a very loaded and hard question because work and home are kind of similar. I, you know, right now for our company, it's very intentional. Um, over the last few years, we realized that. So Navajo Power itself as a company, these are some of the benefits we offer. So we have unlimited vacation. Um, if you need to take a break, you need a day off, you need a month off, you just let your team members know, your leads know, and you can, you know, go holiday for a month if you wanted to, or two months if you need to. Usually we find more people don't take holidays when you give them unlimited vacation. So we actually make people schedule two weeks every every so many months. Make sure you're at least scheduling two weeks of time off. You know, that time away helps you to process and be able to be a better effective, you know, leader, employee, you know, just you, you're, you're more present when you're refreshed versus in a constant mode of burnout. Um, burnout is real. You know, we've seen it in our team where you can actually work yourself to a point that you're no longer in it for the right reasons. And it becomes even physically and emotionally distressing. So we always encourage that. We have a health and well, wellness bonus in our company. So there's a bonus in every person uh, salary where they can take money for massages, gym membership, you know, we really are starting to focus on how to make our place um, a, a valuable place to work, but also that takes into account the humanness of us. Like we're not machines, we're not designed to work, you know, 24 seven. Um, but for me personally, you know, it's like having hobbies, you know, and being able to do multiple things. You always find me working on something, but a lot of times, like, you know, when I need downtime, it's usually like vacationing or traveling. I fortunately, because I work in so many tribal communities, get to visit some of the most beautiful places in the world. And so that has kind of taken me to like, when I go somewhere, be intentional about staying a few extra days and trying not to schedule work for that. Um, the other is, you know, taking up opportunities. I try not to say no when people invite me to things. So a lot of hunting, camping, hiking, you know, uh, traveling to meet people for coffee, river trips. Um, during the pandemic, I bought a paddleboard and took a lot of meetings on the river. So that was one interesting thing. <laughs> but, you know, I just, you, wanted to try you, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got you got to do things like that essentially make you happy to be where you are, because eventually if you don't do that. And if the other thing I encourage is try to take your office out of your house. You know, there's no fun being able to wake up and see your desk, see your work, and it start to weigh on you. You know, it's good to have separation. At least, you know, like, that's the other thing we do is we encourage, we, um, 
We also give people the ability to rent um, co-working spaces so they can go and get a sub office somewhere in, in, in the, so they can get somewhere to, to do work and then return home and, and they can separate the two, you know, at least, um, you know, from, from a mental perspective. All right. Thank you. And then we have a question from Dave Castillo. Is Navajo Power and Navajo Power Home still pre-revenue? If so, at what point do you expect to, that to change? So Navajo Power had its first, like we had our first nearly $2 million of revenue last year. Um, that will continue to grow. So we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, we hope to be more profitable in the next two years. For Navajo Power Home, it's, what is it now, four months old, five months old. So um, it should be profitable within, I think sustainability hits once we cross like 500 systems. So in the next probably year or so, um, we have a bit more of a sustainable outlook. Um, but they take revenue every month for Navajo Power Home. That, that, that one's like, it's just when, when we'll cross over the CapEx. Okay. <clears throat> And then I'm not sure if we touched on the uranium question. Go ahead, ask, ask several, them all, several them questions. All. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does how close is the uranium mine to the solar farms? How does coal mine chapter benefit from a solar farm? Um, is coal mine chapter certified to benefit from the solar farms? And then if not, who benefits? So the proximity to, to uh, we have to create buffer zones for the uranium. Um, essentially, we have setbacks. We are within proximity, so it's a few hundred feet um, setback from exist remediated uranium. Um, what we've done is we've taken, again, radiologists out to the site, and we've measured um, the impact of that. Um, what we found is essentially it's safe to work in those areas, but prolonged duration meaning like living putting a home there is not advisable so just with the amount of hours of exposure um i think it's like every hundred hours you get about a um uh the equivalent of a um what do they call it uh um an x-ray so for every hundred hours you spend on that site so the whole site, and, and, and that's like within a close proximity. So the whole environmental site plan for us is essentially to limit the amount of duration that people are spending in areas that have elevated, you know, uh, and as we quantify that, but for the most part, most, the majority of our areas don't have any, the, the amount of radiation on the area is equivalent to the parking lot and quality in into the city. So there is radiation in the in the parking lot into the city, just so you guys know. But that background radiation is the same as most of our site. So we we do know the quantifiable metrics. We have studied that, and the monitoring system will be a big part of how we do that. As far as benefits to the coal mine chapter, the way we've been thinking about this is: what's the incentive for communities to participate in our projects if the land does not bring back returns to the community? You know, why would anybody give a, a parcel of land if it doesn't go to work back for, you know, the benefit of the people that have been caretaking it for a while? We have a pretty robust platform where we've developed a criteria for what revenue buckets go where. So there's a portion of the revenue that compensates permittees for damages. So essentially, this is because we are impeding on areas they were using either for grazing, farming, ranch, whatever it may have been. Um, and so we have to compensate them for that. So there's, there's a portion in there we do with the consent process. For the communities, it's always been my belief that communities, just like other municipalities and counties across the country, use local business revenues to be able to invest back in the community programs. And so we came up with a theory that's very similar to like the... Um, the tax regime on the Navajo Nation, this is like a 50-50 split. You take 50% going directly to the community, 50 goes to the nation and gets divided amongst the benefit for the entire nation. So we try to use comparable programs, but ideally there'll be a fund. There'll be a revenue that comes from um, uh, the, the actual lease. And we have been talking with the community about this. 
Um, it's a payment for land. So for every acre that we use, we will have a monthly rent or a yearly rental payment that we'll pay at the beginning of each year um, as a land payment. It goes to the permittees, to the community, and to the Navajo Nation. And then the Navajo Nation, because there is no local tax code, will get the taxes associated with all the development and, and the project. So coal mine will benefit from, one, the revenues from the, the, the land um, uh, the land rental fees, the land lease. The next way that it benefits is we've also committed to being able to train employees and kind of bring as many of those jobs as locally as possible. There's more than just solar jobs. You know, we need folks helping with security. We need operators, you know, all kinds of different associated as, as well as entrepreneurs, you know, to help with, you know, there's places for people to stay. There's gas stations, all, all that kind of work. Um, so all those are kind of factors that we're looking at, um, but that's that's all the pieces that, um, well, some of the pieces. The next thing that we're doing is as Navajo Power, we've committed to helping the chapter attain certification. So under the NES administration, one of his caveats was he wanted to help coal mine and Cameron because we're kind of working in both chapters. We have to connect the project to the util or to the substation that's located in the Cameron chapter, but essentially providing support to that. And under the Indian collective arrangement, they provided a bit of like capital to help um, do some of the planning and the resource development that's needed uh, to get certification. And so coal mine itself, you know, we've offered that multiple times that we can help you get certified. Ultimately, it's up to the community, you know, like the, the local leadership has to make that that um, that decision on how they want to proceed with that, because essentially it's up to them to do the work. Um, and then eventually we do have other mechanisms that we thought about. There are like fiscal sponsorship arrangements that we've come up as plan B and plan C. Should the Navajo Nation say that these guys need additional additional, um, you know, management? And so those are all things that have previously been done in forms like the Utah Navajo Trust Fund, the Housing Discretionary Fund held at the Navajo Land Commission. Um, multiple, I mean, there's just multiple examples of ways that you can adjust, you know, the, the regulations so that it fits the needs of the community. And we, we are really, um, because of our experience with tribal development, you know, we're really exploring all those options and, you know, we'll continue to work with the Niagara administration and the new, the 25th Nation Council to make sure that those benefits do land in that community. So it's a long-winded way of saying, yes, there's going to be benefits to Coal Mine Canyon. And, and, you know, we are very optimistic that, you know, our planning has a lot of inclusion from the folks at the land department, the minerals department, the department of justice, the division of natural resources. So we've gone around as well as talked to, you know, delegates in the Navajo Hopi Land Commission about how we can make sure that this, this benefit that is derived from the former benefit freeze continues to, to help re regenerate the economy and assist in, you know, the regenerative um, development that's needed there post, you know, Bennett freeze um, being lifted. Okay, <clears throat> we're 17 minutes over, uh, but we do have one last question from Mr. Nathaniel Brown. Uh, any pathway you can share from philanthropy or foundations? Uh, could I ask Mr. Brown to maybe expand a little bit? Like, what uh, yes. You know yes. What that's okay. Thank you for the presentation, Brent. I've been working with some with Bank of America, and I've actually invited some of my friends this past weekend. I really like how you said, um, you know, there's we can't create enough. There's always this mentality of scarcity, right? So I invited some people last Thursday to Phoenix to Bank of America to um, an endowment meeting and creating a uh, philanthropy working with philanthropists, foundation, charitable organizations, then there's a tribal side also. Um, so I'm still exploring uh, um, that. I also created a nonprofit, Nahat's Elit Initiative, and uh, we've been doing pretty good. Um, actually, we're, we're debating in, in Kayenta Chapter House right now, They the, the, the new uh, leadership does not want 
they, they still want to support NTUA, and you mentioned that. <laughs> so we're still trying to train our people, our Kayenta Chapter House leadership to think outside the box, right? And I created, and I'm actually texting the chapter president. Yeah, so anyways, again, it, like there's so many layers that you mentioned, but back to philanthropy, um, I'm still navigating and finding yeah. uh, a gap. And um, I I'm also attend the monthly, um, the Native American philanthropy uh, meeting uh, <clears throat> with some individuals. So, hey, we'll invite you to do a presentation there. But anyways, um, I, I know that the nation doesn't also have a mechanism, let's say yeah. the chapter. So we've been working on creating that with Dr. Yellowman, but unfortunately now she's no longer there. Uh, so we kind of, and there's a problem, um, with Navajo also with CEOs leadership changing and everything gets disrupted and we have to go back to ground zero with that department and then relearning the um, um you know talking about our projects again re-educating so that's where 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 I'm at but thank you for the inspiration um I think you're gonna need a, a lot of doses of my like Navajo and and Hopi inspiration from wherever all of you are so I'm still navigating as well uh, thank you. Yeah, to, to talk about your question a little bit, you know, that pathway for philanthropy. I mean, you know, that, that's always been, it's one of the challenges is like projects need to be created. There's, there's got to be pilots. There's got to be leads. There's got to be examples that philanthropy will land in. And one of the other things, and this is something I talk with Nick Tilson a lot about, is like, I think it's a half of, what does he always say, a half of 1% of philanthropic capital in, in the US goes to indigenous communities, one half of 1%. So even though we're a larger part of the population and much more, you know, we have a lot of needs, mostly capital doesn't land in our communities. And I think there's two reasons. One of them is we saw during the pandemic, the whole reason the need for the Navajo, you know, um, I can't remember your full name, but the Navajo, you know, uh, uh, COVID Relief Foundation essentially was there wasn't another option that was straightforward and said this is what we're going to do so that was a necessity to create that you know and and my kind of you know mantra around this is like one we got to challenge those those institutions the other is like we got to get them to see that there are more ways to invest in our communities than investing in our governmental system you know you can invest in our communities by investing into entrepreneurs by investing into not off it's that directly provide resources you know the challenge has to be that they see that that we provide that introduction the other is that we give them projects and places they execute and i was just on a call i was late to this call because i was talking about a foundation and they're saying well we invested in the university into arizona state to figure out how to do off-grid on navajo and i kept pointing and said we're doing it like just invest in us you know it's like you can go and study that all day long you know, research plans, this, 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 our communities are filled with shelved plans that were all funded, they were researched, they were talked about. And then by the time we approved them, they were no longer valid and we had to put them next to the one that we just did five years ago. So I think the speed of how we deploy resources is really what philanthropic efforts are looking for is how quickly can we get from me putting this money in your account to it impacting that thing you said you're going to impact if we can prove that that's quicker and there's a better way to do it that's all they're really looking for you know that's just, that's the part of it the other part i would say that i've challenged with philanthropic effort is like you know, we need to invite them more into our communities. You know, it's one thing for them to see us on a presentation deck, but it's another for them to get to visit the people. That's been Navajo Power's strength. You know, we've we've had investors at, um, you know, I've slept with them in Airbnb Hogans. You know, I brought them to, you know, Sheep Camp. We had a Hajonja one time. We had investors that that was for Navajo Power. And, uh, that one was by far one of the most successful ones because afterwards they, they decided they wanted to invest. But there's ways that we can include them in our process. You know, it's like we're we're not separate from them because if we start thinking like that, they're going to invest in us in that way. You're on that side, I'm on this side. 
We got to bridge their community with ours and get them to understand what it's like to put, put foot in our areas so that they feel that they can commit to investing and they feel good about that, you know? So I think those are all parts that I really, you know, speak a lot about is just like, you know, there's, there's, there's one way to talk about it and there's another way to like just showcase and show it. So I encourage you and I'd be happy to present at, at, at your organization um, and talk about this because the need is everywhere. And the more we can help, the more we can connect. There's some, there's some things that maybe we have that, you know, we could help you with because I think we're, we're all after the same thing, which is prosperity for communities. Like that's, that's a big part of what we're doing. So, yeah. Short answer, I guess. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, I do see Cassandra's hand up. Do you want to go ahead and answer one last question, Brett? Okay. Right, Cassandra? Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> this is um, a thing that we are trying to be intentional about is telling our truth, right? And storytelling is a big part of conveying and communicating, illustrating, being relatable or having our lived experience being understood. Part of that truth is genocide, forced assimilation, as you talked about systemic oppression and the consequences of that. A lot of these philanthropists have built their empires on our genocide, right? So how do you navigate having that dialogue with them while still honoring your truth? I think I've earned this position. And I always say this, like, it's a bit, maybe this is the one part of the ego I let, I let, I let kind of slide out a bit is we got to be honest with them. You know, I've sent pictures of Rockefeller gas station signs that are left as that one in Cow Springs to the Rockefeller Foundation. So you guys did this, you know, so bring your money back here and help us fix these communities. It, you know, sometimes it's a challenge, you know, but at the same time, like I probably can do that because I've done quite a bit, you know, to offset my, my challenge, like, you know, by, by providing, by delivering power to homes, by working in these communities, by being available and, and, you know, being honest, you know, even up front with the challenges that I have, you know, it, it's, it's a really like, interesting world we're living in when you know the conglomerations of companies are leading to those who have always exploited just constantly getting back on top it's one of the challenges with the renewable energy space is those same folks that made their money in uranium made their money in in oil and gas and then coal are now putting on you know, there's stickers on solar panels. And so they're saying, oh yeah, we're doing good for the world here. I don't know how many former gas executives that I've met that said, hey, we're into the clean energy space. I used to work for Exxon or I used to work for Texaco. It's like, you know, the, the, the reality of our situation is like those things and those people don't go away. They find a way to, 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 to come around. Now what we have to do is, you know, and, and I've always had this philosophy is like, I will take their money and spend it on my community every day of the week. You know, I'll find a way to, to get that done. You know, I can't be selective on, on that part, but I can like be a part of them, at least having some sort of restitution back to, to our area. And I think that's the part we have to be the bridge of is from where we are to where we have to get, there's a gap that needs to be built and all of you guys are part of building that 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 bridge how we do that is going to be really selective on like what we can do with the resources we have and how we challenge the system that that um you know that bridge in the past has always been unattainable because of those those factors you know oppression racism genocide you know i still you know i would say like i'm very blessed and in some way privileged that I have a circumstance where, you know, being a male in this industry, it's not untypical. Um, but creating space and showcasing how we're different. Navajo Power, we have majority women on our team. Like we're, we're actually majority women in an energy company, which is the rarest thing you'll see out there. And that's because we made an intent 
on bringing women into our field and giving them a space and a, and a role in, in being a part of this. Um, that's how you show intent. It's like you challenge them, not just in saying something, but by doing it, proving it, and then saying, I need you to copy this, you know, because if you don't do it, you, you don't have an excuse, you know, I've done it already. And that's the challenge even with the energy access is I can say, you know, people need to do better at off-grid energy, not because it needs to get done, but because I've done it for, for years and I know, you know, exactly what I'm saying. And, um, you know, getting that, that cachet of data, information, and precedent is going to be the key to, to challenging those that have taken advantage of us in the past to pay back, or at least, you know, to be fair. And then again, going forward, it's our challenge to build up our own resilience and our own wealth. So we're not subject to that again. You know, that's the goal. All right. With that, thank you, Brett. With that, I'm going to share my screen and take over for a minute to share some last announcements. Uh, thank you again, Brett, for being here. I know you're a very busy person, but you have a lot to share and a lot of valuable knowledge, like our parents. <clears throat> um, for our audience members, thank you again for being here today and thank you for all your questions and your participation. If you missed any part of Brett's presentations, Chains Labs will have this session posted to the Chains Labs YouTube channel very soon. Um, so keep a look out for that. And if you missed any part of my portion for today's session and want to rewatch it after all my stuttering, <laughs> Chains Labs um, services or anything, um, as far as information about what we do or how you can get into touch with any of our network here, um, so you can reach out to me. My email is here, Raquel at nativestartup.org, or you can visit our website, nativestartup.org, for more information as well. And with that, I will bid everybody a good day. I hope you all keep warm and stay safe in the snow, uh, make good decisions, and we'll see you guys next time. Oh, I do have one more workshop next week, and that will be posted in a little bit as well. So you guys have a good way, good day, bye.